and I will say it in Hebrew, it was just being repeated again and again, whether studying the prophets or the Hebrew literature or the history of Zionism or the status of the Jews in Palestine, Amenu, our nation, and don't call it our people. I see in the press always, whenever they have a Hebrew word, Amenu, they translate it our people to hide something. People is nice. Nation is nationalism. You don't see peopleism. So they always translate it, whenever they should translate it our nation, Amenu is translated our people. Amenu is our nation. And then was Artsenu, our country, our fatherland. Amenu, Artsenu, and then came a word that was so stupid, but we swallowed it, Moladetenu. Moladet means a birthplace, our homeland, where we were born. I don't think there was one student in the entire gymnasium. It's a little exaggerated. In my class, I'm trying to think fast and recall all my nice classmates. And they were nice boys and girls. I don't recall one who was born in Arab Palestine. We were all immigrants who came from Russia, either to escape the pogroms or to get a Jewish education or a Zionist education, as most of them were there. We heard day after day, whenever possible, whenever a teacher could stick it in, even in science, somehow they managed it. Amenu, Artsenu, Moladetenu. This was given to us with our, on our hikes, in our classes, Saturday meetings when we, may, when we were gathered to discuss political issues preached at us. Amenu, Artsenu, Moladetenu. And that was to subvert us, to poison us, into becoming Jewish nationalists. That was, remember, from 1904, such as others had it, and for me from 1908 to 1913. And the gymnasium became a hotbed for wild, insane political nationalism. There we had no religious services of any kind. They were agnostics or atheists, as you might call them. I never met a rabbi all through the five years at the gymnasium. We never had a religious service all through those five years. Sabbath morning we used to come to the gymnasium either to hear lectures about Zionism or singing. And as I had a good voice, I joined the chorus even though I did not know how to read music. We were taught to hate the Arabs, to despise them, and above all, to drive them out from our Mola de Tenu, our homeland, from our country, Artsenu. It is ours, not theirs. Quoting the Bible, of course. There were only some 35,000 Jews in Arab Palestine, where there were about 600,000 healthy, normal, sane, hardworking, innocent, unknowledgeable Arabs. And in the gymnasium, we were taught Amenu, Artsenu, Moladetenu, our nation, our country, our birthplace. And for five years they were pumping into me Jewish nationalism, Zionism, unsuccessfully, happily. Happily for me as a civilized being who's, who belongs to the world and not to any political nationalist group. All through the time that I lived in Palestine, first in Jerusalem and then in Jaffa, Tel Aviv, it was all Arab. There were few Jewish colonists and fewer cooperative colonists of which I always well remember with affection and admiration because many a week 
I worked and slept on some of the kibbutzim in Galilee during my student days at the gymnasium, the one and only an outstanding, eternal contribution that Israel might contribute to the world if it stops going back on itself as it begins to do already now and stressing political nationalism. Incidentally, when I joined the gymnasium, we rented a house from an Arab halfway between Jaffa and the sand dunes, which were bought at that time to establish a Tel Aviv on it. There were a few Jews in Tel Aviv, a couple of thousand, I would say, a few merchants, tailors, shoemakers, and Orthodox Jews who spend their time in the synagogue praying three times a day and living off the subventions, Chalukah it was called, dividing handouts given to them by either organized schnorrerei, collections made abroad by Palestinian Jewish emissaries, or by children living abroad who supported their elderly folks who wanted to come and live and then die in the Holy Land, as they called it. I'm trying hard, honestly, to recall a Jewish workman, a mason, a man who puts brick on brick, or in those days there were no bricks there, there were stones. You hewed them, you shaped them, and you put them one on top of the other and filled it in with small stones and concrete. I never met a Jewish mason. I never met a Jewish worker on the farm, in the vineyards of my uncle, or any other one. Not a Jew ever cultivated the land. There was always Arabs. My uncle used to wear a suit with a tie and polished shoes, which the Arab polished for him in the morning long before he got up. And that was the life that the Jews at that time had, before a Ben-Gurion and the young laborers came, few of them, relatively speaking. There were no Jews in Palestine to speak of, except these few workers, there were all in all perhaps two, three thousand among all the collective farms in Galilee and down there. There were so few in there, they didn't amount to anything. The Arabs could have wiped us out in no time, had there been any organized scheme. There was no group that planned anything, that organized to do anything among the Arab, the non-Jewish population. There were individuals, Zionist fanatics and Orthodox fanatics kept on going to Palestine, but the masses of the Jews, of the Jewish people, did not choose to go to Palestine. They went to, a, to the United States, to Canada, to South Africa, to South America. And there were years, even after the Balfour Declaration, I believe 1929 or 1927, 28, when poor Chaim Weizmann had to go to Romania to plead with the Jews, look, we have extracted the Balfour Declaration from the British on really no grounds. They keep on asking us, where are your Jews? Now, if we are to have an Eretz Israel, and you, I believe, believe in it, they did not. Come to Palestine, because there were about 9,000 more, 9,000 Jews who emigrated from Palestine is again 6, 7,000 who immigrated into Palestine. Only in 1933, the Jewish workmen begin to appear in Arab Palestine, while the Arabs multiplied in their natural way, and Jews didn't multiply but increased 
in accordance with the immigration into Palestine, artificial as it was. Jews went to South America, Brazil, Argentine, Australia, New Zealand, and America and Canada, but they did not care to go to Palestine because they felt that they would be going from the frying pan into the fire. And not until the Jews began to run away from Germany and the German Jews who were working in Germany began to work in Palestine and a Jewish worker with a hatred for the Goy, such as the ghetto Jews in Eastern Europe, in Romania, in Russia, in Galicia had for the Gentile, they had it a hundredfold. And that was the beginning of the real warfare between Jews in Palestine and the Arabs of Palestine. So you mentioned that until Ben-Gurion came into Palestine with that wave of new uh, settlers, young Jewish settlers from Europe brought in and by the Zionists, Ben-Gurion came about 1913, which I believe was about the period you were leaving, that be before that, the, most of the Jewish settlers didn't actually work the land themselves. They owned the land but used Arab labor. Uh, what was the change? Ben-Gurion's men did actually work when they worked in these collective farms, the kibbutz, as they're called today, the kibbutzim and moshevim. These new people did work the land. Yes, but the only productive Jew that I met in my time, and beginning with the time that I was in Jerusalem, attending the cheder and the yeshiva, I only remember one Zionist boy, Yoshpe, I think was his name, and his father was a well-to-do Jew who came from South America or from somewhere in the world and bought a little bit more land than he could afford and didn't have enough money to plant all the orange trees he wanted to plant and didn't have enough money to live off the savings for the four or five years until fruit came which you could sell. Yoshpe is that his last name or the first, I don't know, was a handsome boy. And he used to ride horses as well as the Arabs. And on the annual contests in horse riding, where the Arabs were the majority, and there were a few Jews, and perhaps only Yoshpe, because we adored him, we worship him. Yoshpe actually once won a prize you know, on horseback riding. He was ahead of the others. That was in sport. Whether he helped his father to plan things because his father was known to be a hard-working person might have been the case. And there might have been a few exceptions. I never saw a Jewish man or boy plant a tree, water a tree. Besides, there weren't many planted, Jewish planted orchards. They were all, most of them, were Arab-owned. The Jaffa orange, that's a, an Arab orange that today still is one of the most favorite on the markets of London or even New York. You hear even in Santa Clara County of Jaffa oranges. They brought plants from, the, from Arab Jaffa and planted them in here. The nicest type of working Jew, working quote unquote if I may put it, the only healthy, youthful, working in quotation marks, Jew that I met first in Jerusalem and then in Jaffa, rarely, but happily, admiringly, were the Shomrim. Shomrim means guardians. They were usually dressed in an Arab outfit with a keffiyeh, I believe you call it, over their heads and the girdle over it, with a gun under the dress and with a horse near them. They were supposed to be watching the Jewish colonists against the Bedouins who penetrated and took away crops and cattle. In fact, I have more than once participated, quote-unquote, as a kid visiting his uncle, when the bells were ringing in, on the tower in Rehovot, and all the farmers were going on foot or on donkey or on horseback 
to the place where there was a skirmish, a battle between bed invading Bedouins, who, because they had no water in their place and didn't have any food, and it was the middle of the summer, were coming to help themselves to what they could get away with in Jewish colonies, a little further away from the center. And from time to time, I recall one very vivid picture. There were men coming, bleeding from their foreheads and noses and faces. There wasn't even a decent arrangement for first aid, but they were returning to the extent that they could to the colony, to the doctor, if there was one ready to help them. There were this shomrim going out always alone or in twos or threes, riding at night time between colonies and around colonies. They were brave boys, you could see it. They were good, sharp shooters. They spoke Arabic fluently. They were romantic boys, and they interfered with our flirtations with the girls because when the girls saw a Shomer coming in, we just didn't amount to anything. That was a romantic Jew, the early nationalist who were beginning to show up in Palestine. Then they organized, the, they didn't call them yet kvutsot, but collective farms, and Ben-Gurion was one of those who organized and was one of them. The records with regard to the, this romantic Jewish Shomrin who guarded the settlements, the records of the Ottoman administration and the British mandate show that al the Bedouins, uh, usually after they had suffered losses of sheep uh, or goats due to uh, drought or disease among the, the, the herds, uh, then began to raid uh, the Jewish settlements. They also, and had been for a thousand years, been raiding Arab villages also. The Jewish uh, colonies were suffering what was happening to many more Arab villages, the raids of the settled Arab by the Badia, the desert yes. Arab, wasn't it? You are perfectly right. And that will clarify this point. There was no anti-Jewishness in any act done by Arabs, whether Bedouins or plain working Arabs or Arab merchants. It was a, a Middle Eastern backward world. Nobody suspected the Jews of being Zionist nationalists until the Balfour Declaration came. 